Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do encourage you to follow the podcast using your favorite podcast software, whether it's TuneIn, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net and become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Sam Spade. The original air date on this one is December the 12th, 1948, and the title is The Bouncing Betty Caper. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Very funny. Certainly took you long enough. Oh, thank you, Sam. Well, do you like them? The oh. girls? Yeah, I guess so. It's your own hair, I trust. Oh, yes, Sam. When it's brushed out, you'll never know anything happens. Whenever you're ready, uh, curly. Oh, gee, you like it that well? Yeah, very cute. Well! Huh. The business. Yeah. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, subject yes. the bouncing Betty Caper. Uh-huh. Dear Dundee. It all began on a Wednesday. My uh, secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, tiptoed into my office and laid an engraved calling card on the desk in front of me. The name on it was Randall Carruthers. She said he looked like money, so I said, show her in. Or him in. She did. Good morning, sir. Do you wish the morning paper? Uh, thanks, I've read it. Dear me. What's the matter? Well, this ashtray, sir. Um, have you a silent butler? I don't even have a noisy one. Oh. In all my years of service, it has been my constant endeavor to keep things neat and tidy, down to the smallest detail. I see. Well, if it bothers you, just dump those butts into the wastebasket. Very well, sir. Uh, if you will pardon the presumption, sir, you could use a well-trained servant in this establishment. Waste paper baskets clean and empty at all times, never allow refuse to accumulate. That's not refuse, that's this month's bills. So I noticed, sir. I also noticed that you have not opened them. From this, I conclude that your services are immediately available. Yeah, and I conclude that in spite of your glad rags and fancy handle, you are somebody's butler. Oh, that is correct, sir. I am first butler in the household of Dr. Mark McGraw. First? Uh, Bleakcliff is the name of the estate. It's near the village of Squid Beach, some 50 miles in a southerly direction on the Pacific coast. You know, I think I'm going to like you as a client, Mr. Carruthers. I mean, it's uh, refreshing to get a few accurate facts without, shall we say, uh, priming the pun. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank You're welcome. You. To continue, not counting the staff, there reside at Bleakcliff three persons. Mm. Dr. McGraw, master of the house since the death of his wife. His stepson, Mr. Anthony McGraw, of whom more later... And Mr. Anthony's sister, Miss Cathy. It is on her behalf that I've come to you, sir. Uh, what is her problem, uh, Mr. Carruthers? Uh, the correct form of address is Carruthers, sir, not Mr. Carruthers. Check. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Now, as to Miss Cathy's problem, sir, uh, someone is attempting to murder her. Specifically, she has, upon several occasions, been shot at from ambush. Twice she has awakened in the night to feel the hands of an assailant closing about her throat. And only yesterday, she narrowly escaped death when her motor car went out of control owing to some blackguard tampering with the steering mechanism. And upon numerous other occasions... That's enough. You have convinced me that she indeed has a problem. Uh, What do the local police think? No one has been to the police, sir. Why not? It's a delicate situation, sir. Uh, Miss Carthy's brother, Mr. Tony, is undergoing treatment for um, uh, nervous disorder, sir. Mm -hmm. The family did not wish to place him in an institution, and since Dr. McGraw, his stepfather, is a psychiatrist, he is allowed to remain at home. I see. He's flipped. Uh, Where do I uh, fit in, Carruthers? Well, sir, if a reputable gentleman such as yourself were to come to Bleakcliff and witness these persistent attempts upon that girl's life, perhaps they could be forced to put the boy away where he belongs. It's possible. 
I'm willing to try. For money. Oh, splendid, sir. Splendid. I, I took the liberty of drawing in your favor a draft upon the First National Bank of Squid Bay, one week's remuneration in advance of your services to the Bleakliff Estate in the capacity of chauffeur. I... Uh, chauffeur? Uh, yes, sir. I thought that might be a capital disguise. Um, have you a better suggestion, sir? Well, uh... No, no, that's okay. Uh, this check. Yes, sir. Uh, 200 bucks. It's a pretty big weekly salary for a chauffeur, isn't it? Well, you will be allowed to shop for the vegetables, sir. Your cut has been added in. I told him I didn't know one vegetable from another, that I was a lousy driver, and in more time than it takes to tell, I was installed at Bleak Cliff in a room above the garage and told to wait there until summoned. I put on my pearl gray uniform with the brass buttons and leather puttees, looked in the mirror, and decided I had missed my calling. But not by much. Nothing happened for nearly an hour, and then I got my first buzz. Yeah, I mean, uh, garage. They left the car quickly. The main entrance. Keep your motor running. I have him locked in the living room, and he's breaking out. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, miss. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, miss. Well, uh, get going, please, please. Uh, darn it, miss. Uh, uh, where's the spark on oh, this? what's uh, the matter with it? Well, it, it's it's uh, flooded. The housing, you know. Uh, uh, oh, he's got the meat cleaver again. Come on, get the store. Well, I'm trying. Get out of here, oh. you! Get out! Stop it! Stop it! You're hurting him. No! Oh. All right. All right. Oh. Put it down, kid. No. Put it down. No. Come on. No. Give it to me. No. What's going on? Oh, don't. I say, who are you? Oh. Haven't you been instructed not to disturb my patient? I'm sorry. I'm new here. When I saw him coming at Miss McGraw with that meat cleaver, I naturally thought that Oh, well, I... no harm done. Come along, Tony. Come along now. Come along, boy. We'll have a nice long talk. Uh, what shall I do with it? Now? Uh, we'll put it back. Oh. You all right? Oh. Oh. oh, sure. I should be used to it by now. By the way, you're new here, aren't you? What's your name? Sam. Sam? Nice. Uh, turn to the left outside the gate, Sam, and drive straight out to the shore road. Well, if I can just... Uh... Hey, I just turned that little key. Look, Ma, I'm driving. I adjusted the rear view mirror so that it showed more of her and less of the rear view. A mile from the house, she ordered me to stop, moved up to the front seat with me, and asked me to drive on. By the time we got to the shore road, she was driving, and I was resting my head on her shoulder. Where are we going? I've got a little hideaway down the coast. It's right on the beach, at the foot of a tall cliff. Hmm. There's a fireplace, a little bar, some records. Got some bop? It's wonderful there with the surf pounding outside, hidden away from the world. You feel so safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't stop. You like it there. You feel as if there's no one else on earth. Time standing still. Oh, if I could just be sure that Mother wouldn't worry about me. <laughs> You're impossible. Okay, Kathy, I'll be serious. Uh, what's with that brother of yours? Tony, I'd rather not talk about that if you don't mind. Well, uh, maybe I can talk about your stepfather. I really should know what kind of a man my boss is. I go for these drives to forget all that. Please don't spoil it for me. Okay, Kathy, okay. Oh, please. The sharp turn into this driveway. Oh. Now we get out here. Yes, ma'am. Down this path. Uh oh. Matt, are you afraid of high places? Yeah, you just pushed me off of one. Oh, Sam, don't be like that. You're pouting like a little boy. Come on, I want to show you my little house. What's so special about your little house? Oh, Sam, if you only knew what my life is like. You only knew what mine is like. I need someone so much to talk to, Sam. As long as you can steer the conversation, you mean. Come on, Sam. I'll show you the house. The path led to a flight of wooden steps that clung to the face of a sheer cliff. There was something like the stairs you find yourself falling down in nightmares. They dropped maybe 200 feet to a crescent of white sand. Watch out for that one step. It's broken. Yeah. You have to make your dream house this hard to get to? Because of Tony. He has vertigo. What? 
When we were kids, he used to chase me, and I'd run down here, and he was scared to follow me. Afraid of heights. He still is. Well, you light us a fire, Sam. The wood's there in the box. I'll go make us a drink. Fire? Who needs a fire? I'm hot. What'd you do before you took up driving? Oh, I, I was a private eye for a while. Oh, how exciting. Nah, it's a sour racket. Tell me about it. Nah. Nah, let's talk about you. Here's your drink. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know about me? Who, uh, me? Mm. Come here. The scent she was wearing was 20 carat, but the story of her life was heavy melodrama. It seemed that Dr. McGraw, a handsome fortune hunter, was a folly of her mother's middle years. But she had come to her senses shortly before she died and cut him out of her will. But that was not the end of it. When Kathy's brother had been faced with the alternative of entering an institution or remaining at home under his stepfather's care, she had begged the doctor to remain in spite of his warnings that her brother might take a notion to kill her. But uh, get this, Dundee, it's real deep. In spite of visible evidence to the contrary, she was convinced that her brother was not out to kill her, but that the doctor was. I couldn't sell myself on that part of the yarn, but she looked so awfully pretty while she was telling it. And suddenly, she didn't look so pretty. An expression of terror was on her face. No! No! Get down! I rolled around to the floor and kicked the lamp out. By the glow of the embers in the fireplace, I could still see the gleam of the gun barrel shoved in through the broken window. I hoped he couldn't see so much. I knocked over a chair to give him something to shoot at. He was already halfway up the face of the cliff on those rickety wooden stairs. At the top, he turned and looked back. Who was it? It was Mark, wasn't it? The doctor? You know better than that. It was Tony. I thought you told me he was afraid of heights. Couldn't come down those stairs. He never did before. Don't you believe me? Yeah. Yeah, Kathy. I may wind up believing the rest of your story. I took Kathy back to Bleak Cliff and stashed her in my quarters over the garage. Then I went into the main house via the back stairs, found her room, and shook it down. In a cabinet, a bunch of war souvenirs. German helmets, grenades, rifles, and other lethal gadgets. In a desk drawer, I found a letter headed U.S. Army, Office of the Surgeon General. It certified that one Anthony McGraw was unfit for military service. Vertigo. Origin, childhood injury to middle ear. Downstairs in the library, I found a shelf of medical books. Vertigo. Vertigo was almost incurable, and there was certainly no quick cure. But some patients had lost their symptoms temporarily under hypnotism. Then it said, see narcosynthesis. I did. Oh, Spade. Uh, I beg pardon, sir. Uh, Mr. Spade. Yeah, whatever are you doing in the butler's pantry, sir? Looking for a butler. Namely you, Carruthers. Oh, may I serve you, sir? Yeah. How do I get an interview with Dr. McGraw? Well, sir, I should I... Oh. <laughs> Strange, after all my years of service, I, I still start as a master summer. Hey, you did it again. Eh, well, I'm sorry, sir. I'd better see what Dr. McGraw wants. Forget it. I'm answering this one. You're not going to drop your disguise, sir. Why not? Who am I kidding, anyway? You rang, Dr. McGraw? Eh? Oh, I didn't ring for you. I rang for Carruthers. I ordered him to tidy up my office while I was at dinner. And look at it. Looks neat as a pen to me, Doctor. Oh, yes, you're new here. Chauffeur, eh? I'm only wearing his uniform. Here's my card. Oh, detective, eh? That's right, Doctor. This one's just about ready to wrap up. Well, you interest me. Uh, Go on. I will. I think you've been trying to use that boy as a murder weapon against his sister. Oh, and you call yourself a detective? If you can call yourself a doctor, I guess I can. You've been treating him with narcosynthesis, haven't you? That's right. Hypnotic drug. Well, he's under it. You brief him on his activities for the day, and he follows through, including assaults with deadly weapons. That would be possible with certain very suggestible patients, but I'm afraid impossible to prove. I think I can prove it, Doctor. You shouldn't leave your textbooks lying around loose. I found out the only way Tony could have walked down that stairway to Kathy's beach house without falling would be temporary relief of his symptoms due to hypnotic suggestion, unquote. I see. What do you intend to do about this theory of yours? What do you suggest? You see this row of buzzers here on my desk? Mm-hmm. Oh, this one is for my secretary. This is to summon Carruthers, and when I press this buzzer, 
two of the most hideous plug uglies you've ever seen will rush into this office, beat you to a pulp, and dump you outside the front gate. That's what I think of your theory. Buzz away, Doctor. I think I like them better than I do you. <laughs> As you wish. <laughs> From where I was on the other side of the room, I didn't know what had happened at first. All I saw was a lot of paper gushing out of the wastebasket. The doctor sure was dead. His midsection was perforated like a shower drain. And in the walls, fanning out around the end of the room, about a yard up from the baseboard, there was a straight line of holes. I dug into one. What I took out wasn't a bullet. It was a perfectly round steel ball. Then I remembered the wastebasket, the paper flying out of it just before the explosion. In the bottom of it, I found the answer. The base of a steel mechanism with German lettering on it. It was a wartime anti-personnel mine that the G.I.s called the Bouncing Betty. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. I didn't wait for the Squid Beach Law to arrive. Who could? I went straight back to San Francisco. You, Lieutenant Dundee, were waiting at my office. Uh, morning, Sam. Hello, Dundee. Uh, about that McGraw killing, Sam. Mm-hmm. The chief down at Skid Beach has asked us to cooperate with the department down there at Skid Beach. Squid Beach, Dundee. Squid, that's right. They say you caught a bus at Skid Beach. Squid, uh, squid. That's right. At a quarter of two in the company of a young woman answering the description of the McGraw girl. Uh Uh-huh. They say that, do they? Uh, They say they got a statement from that butler, uh, Carruthers. Yeah, well, it's open and shut anyway. The butler hired you, the girl is wanted, and you're hiding her out. Why? Why not? Well, it's established that the girl hated the deceased and bickered with him constantly. The doctor and the boy were pals. That girl's guilty as... You've been able to place her in the murder room? I don't know, but here's an item. She worked with an army ordinance uh, during the war Mm -hmm. in research. Subject, I made a note of that. Uh, Enemy landmines, anti-personnel. One of the reports she helped put out was on the bouncing Betty. Yeah? Definitely. Hey, where are you going, Sam? It's been so lonesome cooped up here all day. Why didn't you tell me you were with Army Ordnance during the war? I don't know. I suppose I thought it was unfeminine or something. Try again. All right, I'll tell you the truth. I had a copy of that report with instructions for the operation of the Bouncing Betty in the desk in my room. What the devil are you doing with a thing like that? I don't know. I was proud of it. It was the only report I worked on with the general. Should have got rid of it. I did. I burned it in the fireplace as soon as I learned what had killed him. You didn't burn it good enough. Sam, they found it. Yeah. Have they arrested Tony? Not yet, but he's definitely sane. He'll have to take the rap for anything he's done. I see. Well, I guess there's no other way. Tony didn't do it, Sam. I did. I want to make a confession. Not to me, please. Not to me. After what happened down at the beach when I knew I was no longer safe anywhere, I realized I had to do it. For Tony's sake as well as mine. When we arrived back at the house, I looked into the dining room and I saw Dr. McGraw eating dinner. I knew it was my chance to get into his office. Yeah? Then what? Well, the bouncing Betty was in my room. There was some wire in the tool chest, and I knew that Carruthers always went tidy, to tidy up while the doctor was at dinner. So I waited until I saw him come out, and then I went in. And I looked around for a place to plant it, out of sight. Then I saw the wastebasket full of paper. It was the perfect hiding place. The whole thing didn't take more than five minutes. Well, say something. I guess I don't know what to say. Go on, say you hate me, Sam. I don't. Wish I did. Oh, Sam. Help me, help me. I'm sorry, baby. I am sorry. I don't know how long we sat there. I held her in my arms until she cried herself out. Then we just looked at each other. I knew if I put it off another minute, I wouldn't call you at all, Dundee. So, with my arms still around her, I reached for the phone. Homicide. Uh, Lieutenant Dundee, this is Sam Spade. Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, Hello. Hello. 
Give me that. Lieutenant, this is Catherine McGraw. I wish to make a full confession in the murder of my stepfather. I walked out while she was still talking to you, Dundee. I knew she'd wait for you, and I didn't want to be there when you took her away. As I walked over to my office, everything she'd said kept coming back to me. I could see her sneaking into her brother's room and getting a contraption out of the cabinet. I could see her hiding behind the door until Carruthers came out after tidying up McGraw's office, dumping ashtrays, emptying waste baskets. And that's as far as I got. I went back to my office to wait. And sure enough, 20 minutes after the papers hit the streets with Kathy's confession, the door opened and he came in. Well, sir, I believe it's turning a bit raw out of doors. Gardner was saying only this morning that we should order out some shrouds for the Sepiglosus Inuata. Uh, am I discommoding you, sir? No, Carruthers, I've been waiting for you. Uh, uh, with your permission, sir, the ashtray. Just dump it in the wastebasket. Uh, well, uh, I am gratified to note that your secretary has been looking after things and has emptied your waste paper basket. This is right and proper. Quite, quite. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, speaking of waste paper baskets... Allow me, Carruthers. You have come to apprise me of your part in the death of the late Dr. McGraw. Am I in error? Uh, you've already divined my purpose, sir. Yes, it was I who placed that infernal machine. In the wastebasket, Carruthers, yes, I know. It struck me as a bit of poetic justice that the buzzer, which that dreadful man used as a symbol of his despotism, should be the instrument of his own destruction. I'm sorry, Carruthers. I'll do all I can. No need, sir. No need. I'm aware that there is no final justification for taking the law into one's own hands. Every man is entitled to trial by jury of his peers. But where, Mr. Spade, where could be found 12 good men and true who would allow themselves to be called the peer of that monster, Dr. McGraw? Period, end of report. Be some mistake. Mistake, Effie? Mistake? No. Well, well the, the butler can't be guilty. That, that's old fashioned. He was an old fashioned butler, sweetheart. Where today can you get help like that? Somebody who empties the ashtrays, keeps the waste paper baskets clean, tidies up around the place. Well, I'd be only too happy to do the same for you, Sam. Well, I know you would, Doc. Considering what happened to Mr. Carruthers' employer, I. Effie, you mustn't allow your mind to dwell on such matters. It's wicked. Sam! Hmm. Who emptied an ashtray in that wastebasket that I just finished cleaning out? Pay it no heed, sweetheart. I'll buy you a silent butler. I'll go type that up. Hmm? Here it is, Sam. I hope I haven't made any mistakes. I'm in such a hurry. Whatever did you do to your hair? Well, I brushed it out, Sam. What happened to the pen curls? I told you, Sam, when it was brushed out, it wouldn't be noticeable. Hours of torture sitting under a hot dryer for something nobody will notice. But Sam, it, it puts bounce in your whole makeup. I get it, the bouncing Effie caper. Oh. Hmm, eyeshadow, new shade of lipstick. You look real gone. Oh, no. Whom is it tonight? Well, it, it's this friend of Maud, Sam. Of course, she's not really serious about him, so it's all right. You're conscious about me? Yet? Oh, no, Sam, no. He, and he's, um, he's definitely not serious about her. I mean, he... Well, uh... Have fun, sweetheart, while Maud burns. Oh, well, she 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 won't. And I suppose you'll be seeing that girl at, uh, what was her name? Oh, yes, Kathy. Well, at least, that... F, I'm not playing in someone else's garden. No. Well, have fun anyway. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Private Detective, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Welcome back. Well, overall, an interesting episode. So the mystery took little work from Sam to resolve. The episode highlights the way that William Spear and Howard Duff develop the character of Sam Spade. If you read the Maltese Falcon, you'll see a character that really is very hard. I've heard some uh, analysis that states that uh, in the book, Spade is a borderline sociopath. And while Duff's take on Spade can get into more of that cards close to the best approach, he can become very emotionally involved and have a lot of feelings that play through. And there's some complexity in that, and I like the way that it's played in this episode. Now, as usual, Sam Spade sends us uh, on a few research trips. Not so much about the Bouncing Betty, although I have to admit, I thought that this would end up having something to do with a doll. So, imagine my surprise with what it was, and that our... Wealthy heiress kept it around the house. But the other thing that might be unfamiliar to modern-day listeners is the silent butler, which is a uh, container uh, with a handle and hinge cover, and it's used for collecting ashes or crumbs. So if your ashtray was full, you would empty it into the silent butler. Or if there's crumbs on the table, put them into the silent butler. There are lots of these that are still around, even though I don't think you can buy new ones anymore. And really, there are some very ornate designs. I found a picture of a... Victorian uh, silent butler that's made of porcelain. But even the aluminum ones show a level of craftsmanship and are very ornate. I was tempted to get one, but then I remembered that we have a dog, and so therefore we would not end up getting enough use out of it, particularly since neither of us smoke. We turn to YouTube where there's a question from Ronser who writes, Is writer Bob Tolman related to the infamous D.A. Hamilton Burger on the Perry Mason TV show played by William Tolman? Good question, and the answer appears to be no. The last names are actually spelled differently. Tolman's had two L's. Just realized how unhelpful that was. Robert Tolman's had two L's. William Tolman's had one L. A William Tolman was born from a well-to-do family in Detroit, while Robert Tolman was born in Colorado. Now, whether there might be some distant relation, I don't know. But William had two brothers, and they were named uh, Jim and Tom. So, no Bob or Robert. So, nothing that would be a close relation or any known relation. However, Robert Tolman wrote one episode of the Perry Mason TV show, uh, the Case of the Crooked Candle, Season 1, Episode 11, in which uh, William Tolman appeared. So, I guess there's that connection, but no uh, relation as far as we know. Thanks so much for the question. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. I want to go ahead and thank M. Cook, Patreon supporter since... August of 2020, currently supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support. That will actually do it for today. I do encourage you to follow or subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast software, including the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, Good Pods, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. We'll be back next Monday with another episode of Sam Spade. And coming a week from Tuesday, we'll be bringing you Meet Miss Sherlock. But listen to us tomorrow for Dr. Tim Detective, where... Hello. Hello, Tim. Is that you? Oh, hello, Jarvis. How are things down at the health department? Well, we can sure use you right now, if you've got the time. Uh, we're pretty short-handed, and something has come up I don't like at all. Right in your neighborhood. Well, anything serious? Fourteen calls during the last hour, and all from your part of town. Food poisoning, I think. 
Hmm. Any clues? Not yet. Haven't had time to check thoroughly. Thought you might help there. I'd like to get out your set of false mustaches and do a little detective work. Why, Doctor Jarvis, you know us junior G-men have given up disguises. The latest thing is to graft noses on us like a bloodhound. <laughs> All right, any way you please. Now, I'll give you a list of the names and addresses of everybody we have that's been re- I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, if you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.